Well, good morning, Mount Gilead. Would you stand with us today? Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord together? Let's worship God today.
this is an open door Your mercy is our treasure When we were in darkness you came Your light fills our hearts So let this be a house of praise That's right that shouts of who you are. You are. You are our God. You are our God. Our strength, our defense, our salvation, our deliverance. Jesus this morning. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Travis. I'm the worship minister here. It's such a joy to hear you sing and declare these truths today. Um, we believe that the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 55 says this. It says, seek the Lord while he may be found and call upon him when he is near. Church, there's no better way to call on the name of Jesus than when we're standing right here in his presence because we believe where two or more gathered together in his name, there he is in the midst of us. And so there's so much this morning that we can be thankful for. There's so much that's going on in our world and in our lives that we need to put our hope and our trust and our faith in Jesus. And so this morning, we're gonna seek the Lord 
while he may be found and call upon him when he is near. So over the next few moments, we're just gonna sing another worship song. And I just wanna invite you, whether this is your very first Sunday here at Mount Gilead or at church in general, this is your first Sunday, we wanna welcome you. Uh, But we also want you to know that this is a time where we just focus in our hearts and our minds on the Lord Jesus Christ, worship him because he's good and he's worthy of it. And we're gonna seek and call upon him while he is near. So let's just take this next few moments and let's just seek the Lord today and trust in him. to sing this in faith today.
Amen. 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 I don't know about you. I love when the church gets to gather together for worship because we're reminded that he is in our midst. We're reminded that God is not distant from us. He doesn't just leave us to figure all of this out on our own. Have you ever felt stuck in life? Have you ever felt that you just had things that were just holding your, your whole heart and mind captive? and you just needed help, that God is here to meet with us in our midst as we continue to worship. We're reminded from the promise of scripture, it says, I, you know, I waited patiently for the Lord and he turned and he heard my cry and he pulled me out of the desolate pit. He pulled me out of the, the muddy clay and he put my feet on a rock and he gave me a firm place to stand and he put a new song in my heart, a hymn of praise to God. And this room is filled with people and people watching online, filled with people that are singing a new song because of what God has done in your life. And we remember that as we continue to worship, as we gather around the Lord's table at communion. And maybe you're here this morning and don't even know if you believe, you're not sure what any of this is all about. Consider this, God is for you and not against you. He sent his son Jesus as a perfect sacrifice because he loves you, he loves all all this world that much that whoever believes in him won't die, won't perish, but will have eternal life. And it's a beautiful thing to have hope here in this life and for the life to come. So we remember these things at communion. We take the bread and we take the juice that resembles Jesus' sacrifice. We remember that this morning. So I'm gonna pray for us. Then there's some scriptures that are gonna scroll on the screen. And after this prayer, it's your opportunity to, to think on those scriptures and to take communion. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus, and the way out of all of the sin that so easily entangles. And Lord, we just wanna fix our eyes on Jesus in this moment and be reminded of who is the, the author and perfecter of our faith. We're thankful that we get to come together and be reminded of the new song we have in our heart and in our mouth because of what you've done and forgiven us of all of our sin. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. We meditate on these things in this time. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.
Well, good morning, Mount Gilead. My name is Fred. I'm one of the ministers here at church, and we're so glad that you're joining us. Whether you're here in the room or you're joining us online, we want to say a big old Mount Gilead welcome to our online audience as well. And if you're here for the first time or you've been here for a couple weeks, I want to invite you to locate the new here form that's near, um, it's on one of the seat backs and probably near you, and that has a QR code on it. Uh, so absolutely permission now to pull out your phone, scan that QR code, and fill out that form. Give us a little information, just about uh, a, a little bit about you, but also anything that you'd like to know about Mount Gilead, you can let us know on that card, and that will just help us to, to follow up with you and, and help you feel more connected around here as you're a part of, of this church body. And if you're here for the very first time, we hope that you would, you would come back. Um, and see us. We're excited about what God is doing. He is on the move in this place. Uh, we're all about helping people become lifelong disciples of Jesus, and we're seeing that happen throughout this entire year. I don't know about you, but does it blow anybody else's mind that it's the second half of 2024 now? Like, that is, that's crazy. To me, but we have seen we have seen people begin their journey uh, following after Jesus um, in, in droves this year. So far, 88 people have said, "I believe that Jesus is my Lord and Savior," and have been baptized uh, this year out of our church. So, we want to praise God for that. Yeah. And we want, to, we want to especially celebrate 30 of those that were baptized uh, just last month in June. And so we're just amazed at how God is continuing to move around here. We look forward to what he has in store for us in weeks to come. Uh, speaking of a couple weeks, uh, coming up, if you've just started your journey either with us at Mount Gilead or um, been baptized here recently, I want to invite you to Starting Point, which is coming up July 21st and July 28th. That's a two-week uh, two week, two session uh, event there um, on Sunday mornings. If you haven't been to Starting Point, come and, and join us and we'll get to know you a little bit more and let you know about all the opportunities that, are, that exist around here so you can get more plugged in with the church. But that's way on, out in the future, you know, like two weeks away. Let's talk about what's coming in like one week. One week from today, July 14th, Vacation Bible School is getting started. All right, and we've got uh, 300. Yeah, we can clap for Vacation Bible School. Absolutely. Absolutely. 300, 300 kids are already signed up for Vacation Bible School. There's more, there's room for hundreds more. So um, register all the neighbors in, in your neighborhood uh, for Vacation Bible School. Also, opportunity for middle school students. Middle school mania is happening um, for v, during the week of VBS as well. Um, but we still need some help. We need about a couple dozen volunteers for Vacation Bible School. And there's all sorts of opportunities. Maybe you love being up close with kids and, and helping them through the night, or maybe you like to love children from a distance, and that's okay too, okay? There's opportunities for you at VBS, so if you've been waiting to see if we really need you, the time is now. We do, we need a couple more dozen volunteers for, for Vacation Bible School and Mania. And all of these exciting things that just help children, help students grow in their faith, they're possible because of the body of Christ coming together to give generously to what God wants to do here in this place, in this community, and around the world. And so as we worship together through, through giving, there's a couple ways that we can do that. We can give by placing our gift in the giving boxes, which are located at the back of the auditorium and out in the lobby. We can also give on the website or on the Mount Gilead app. So you can, you can make your gift any of those ways and just know that every dollar of that gift is going to, to advance the kingdom of God here, uh, near, and far. Let me pray for us quickly and then Jeff is gonna come out and continue our imperfect series. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this opportunity to be together this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to just give a portion back to you and, and see how you would use these gifts and offerings and our generosity to, uh, to expand your kingdom. Father, I pray that you would speak through Jeff to us this morning and help our hearts and minds to be in a posture to hear from you. We pray these things in Christ's name, amen.
Did I hear Fred correctly or did I hear him wrongly? He said Jeff was going to continue this imperfect series. <laughs> he, he is so right. And this is going to be a very imperfect sermon from a very imperfect person. And I, I just don't know if I appreciate Fred calling that out or not. <laughs> well, here we go. You knew it was coming. We can't honestly cover the life of King David without addressing what we're going to address today. It is time to talk about you know who and you know what and you know why. Yeah, David and Bathsheba. We've talked about David and Goliath and David and Jonathan and David and Saul, but this David and Bathsheba stuff is a whole different ball game. In fact, it was scheduled for a week or two from now until we realized, as imperfect as we are, that it was scheduled for VBS Sunday. Not a really good idea. So we had to skip some things and turn some things around to do this today. And before we step into this sordid chapter of David's life, let's acknowledge that at this point, David is no longer a young man. And he's no longer on the run. And he's no longer mistreated by the former king, King Saul, because Saul's now dead. At this point, as we've jumped ahead in the story, David has consolidated his power. He now knows what it is to be king and sit on the throne. He has unquestioned authority. He's grown accustomed to the pleasures of the palace. He knew what it was to live in adversity, and now he's living in prosperity. He has multiple wives. He has servants. His wish is their command. He delegates many of his unpleasant responsibilities, and he lives in luxury because he is now the undisputed king of Israel. But what is about to happen in the text we read today has been referred to as the continental divide in David's life. Because in spite of all the adversity that he had gone through, David usually did things right. And after this point, this divide in his life, even though God forgave him, things just seemed to go downhill for the rest of his life and kingdom. 2 Samuel chapter 11, just the first five verses to begin. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army, and they destroyed the Ammonites and they besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. And one evening, David got up from his bed and he walked around on the roof of the palace, and from the roof, he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful. And David sent someone to find out about her. And the man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Uriah the Hittite. David knew that name. In fact, he knew it well. And it would help us to identify Uriah quickly, Bathsheba's husband. You might not know this, but David had an elite group of fighters they were called mighty men. And in all of his kingdom, with all of his hundreds of thousands of soldiers, these mighty men only numbered 30. They were like David's special forces. They were like an elite uh, SEAL team. And they were David's most capable, loyal men. And they performed some legendary heroic uh, feats. I'd love to take the time to tell you about these feats, but we don't have time to do so. And Uriah, the husband of Bathsheba, was one of those elite, loyal band of brothers that were closest to David. And David finds out that this beautiful woman that he had seen from the rooftop is actually Uriah's wife. So when David finds that out, the alarm bells should have sounded in his mind. Well, they should have sounded before that. David should have said to himself, well, alarm bell number one, I, I'm a married man. I don't look at other women. Alarm bell number two, she's married. Alarm bell number three, she's married to your friend and loyal soldier. Alarm bell number four, Uriah, her husband, is a bad Jose. You don't mess with his wife if you value your life. But Uriah is out of town. 
Matter of fact, he's out of town fighting a war and fighting battles for David. So David silences all the alarm bells in his mind and he makes his move. The next verse, then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him and he slept with her. Now she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanness. And then she went back home and the woman conceived and she sent word to David, I'm pregnant. ruh -roh. Now understand, uh, David is a tactician. He is a veteran problem solver. He's handled crisis before. He knows how to put a good spin on something. So he calmly takes action. He decides, brilliant plan, plan A, he's gonna give Uriah some military leave time, some furlough. That way Uriah can come home, spend a few intimate days with his wife Bathsheba and end up believing that the child is owned because in, the, in, in those days there was no paternity tests or DNA tests, so this plan will work. Easy capizzi, right? So David sends word to the commander of the armies, Joab, and he summons Uriah to come back to Jerusalem. And when Uriah gets back to Jerusalem, first thing he does is he goes right in to see David. And David makes everything sound legit by asking for a battle report from the field. And then he sends Uriah home to Bathsheba. But David miscalculated. He misjudged what a noble man Uriah was. Uriah didn't go home. Uriah slept on the doorstep outside the palace. He didn't even visit his wife Bathsheba. And what he said was, all of my comrades, my band of brothers are out there on the battlefront and they're hungry and they're cold and they're working and I'm not going to go home and enjoy the pleasures of home and my wife while my band of brothers is out there on the battlefield suffering. So David's plan didn't work. It's time to go with plan B. David thought, well... I'll just keep him here a little longer. I need to get him drunk. So he invites Uriah to the palace again for dinner and he gets him all liquored up so that he would lose inhibition and then go home to his wife. But even in his inebriated state, Uriah was a better man than David and he didn't go home. Rut row. We still have problems. Plan A didn't work. Plan B didn't work. So David implements... Plan C, sort of the nuclear option here. He sent Uriah back to the war, but before Uriah left, David gave him a note. And he said, take this note, give it to your commander, Joab. And in the note was a command from David to Joab to take Uriah and to put him on the front lines of battle right at the wall of the enemy, knowing that Uriah would be killed if that happened. And Uriah was such a faithful man that he took that note back. He didn't dare take a look at it himself. He carried his own death warrant and directive and he gave it to Joab and Joab did what King David said and he put Uriah at the front of the battle and Uriah died, problem solved. And when David got word that his loyal friend and soldier was dead, here's what he said. Oh well, that's war. Happens all the time in battle. You win some, you lose some. Government scandals and cover-ups are nothing new. This is a scandalous cover-up. Notice the complicity of David's underlings. There's no accountability. There's no protest. David rules. He's in charge. What he says goes. Well, where do we go with this today. We got lust, we got adultery, we got family wrecking, we got abuse of power, we got conspiracy, we got manipulation, we have murder from David. Yeah, David, the man after God's own heart. Now, most people have at least heard about the story of David and Bathsheba, and a lot of people approach this story with a partial or an incomplete or one issue agenda. In other words, we're gonna to go to this story and we're gonna get what we want from it. And I can think of a half dozen different agendas or more, most of which, not all, but most of which contain at least some element of truth. Let me mention a few quickly. 
I think the first and, and most common one is uh, the agenda that whitewashes the offense. We're just going to whitewash what David did. Got to protect David, right? I mean, he's a main character in the Bible. He's the greatest king of Israel. He's the author of part of your Bible, the Psalms. He's an ancestor of Jesus. He's a man after God's own heart. He's a foreshadowing of King Jesus. He made it into the great faith chapter in Hebrews 11. So we tell David's story. We skip some key details. We minimize his sin and offense, and we move on. Because we got to protect David because he's a big man in the Bible. And I, I can sympathize with that approach, even though it's wrong. I, I can at least understand why people do it. But scripture doesn't allow that. In fact, the Bible always paints painfully, brutally honest portraits of its own main characters. So we're not going down that road to just try to whitewash what David did. There's another agenda I see sometimes. It's based on truth, but it's gone, gone too far. And it's what I call the cheap grace agenda. It goes something like this. Oh yeah, David did some bad stuff. David did a whole bunch of, of terrible stuff, but God forgave him and he lived happily ever after. So I don't really need to worry about fighting temptation that hard because at the end of the day, God forgives everything and he understands and he wants me to be happy. And after all, nobody's perfect and I can play now and not have to pay later. So we read the David story to excuse ourselves. After all, if this man after God's own heart did what he did, then I can do what I do and it's, uh, it's eventually gonna all, all be cool with God. Third agenda is the double standard agenda. You look at what David did and you say, well, it's a guy thing. Boys will be boys. After all, you can't, afford, you, you can't expect the big dogs to stay on the front porch. It's a, it's a problem as old as time. It's a rite of passage. I, I, men just can't help themselves and that's just how it is. That's life. Now, if a woman does the same thing, then she is a person of questionable character. We have names for her. And she's a temptress and a seductress. But men, you know, ah, well, that's just part of being a man. And some people go so far as to make Bathsheba the villain. And we've all seen fathers who not only excuse, but they even encourage and praise this kind of behavior in their sons. And so we use the story of Bathsheba to promote a double standard. David's just a man. And then we take it to the other extreme and we might put a hyper me too agenda on this. Almost every Bible I've ever read has a heading over 2 Samuel 11. It says something like this. David's affair with Bathsheba or David's sin with Bathsheba or David's grievous sin. But right now there is a major controversy even in academic circles about whether we should call what David and Bathsheba did an affair or whether we should call it rape. I mean, after all, how do you say no to the king? And we have to admit, there is a power dynamic at work here. There is an imbalance of power. And what happens is this debate gets extremely hostile with people on both sides demonizing those who come to different conclusions. I could probably argue coherently from either perspective. But since the Bible doesn't call David a rapist, I'm not going to call him a rapist. I, I know he was an adulterer. He was a liar. He was a murderer. He was a conniver. And I know he took advantage of Bathsheba with kingship and power. Maybe not brute force, but possible coercion. But the details are simply not completely conclusive. There was another king in the Old Testament who called on Esther to compromise her morals. And Esther said, no. Could Bathsheba have said no? I mean, think of some of the presidential sex scandals. A president who would say, you can do whatever you want when you're a celebrity. Or one who would have a 23-year-old intern in the White House, and he's the most powerful man in the land. What would you call those events? And though there may be some truth in that, there, this is not an agenda that is primary in the story of David and Bathsheba. There's another agenda. There's some value in it as well. It is the sex education agenda. And in this approach, the insights that come from this story into sexual sin become the only use for this passage. As if 
These insights are the primary purpose for including this in Scripture, to give us a warning and education on the dangers of sexual sin. And indeed it does, because we read Psalms, when we get to the next book of the Bible, Proverbs in chapter 6 and verse 27, it says, can a man scoop fire into his lap without his clothes being burned? And the implied answer is, no, he can't. But this story, though it does accomplish this purpose, is so much more than just a cautionary alarm bell for sexual temptation. It's about way more. It's about pride and entitlement and selfishness and lack of accountability, and the list could go on and on. In fact, uh, I'm 62 years old. I've seen a lot of things like this in life, and I have come to the conclusion that when you see a massive fail like this, it's seldom just all about the lust. It's usually about the pride or the entitlement. She makes me feel good about myself. He paid attention to me. And it ends in an affair, but it starts with something more innocent than that. So though there are great lessons here about this subject, and I've often preached them, and that's where we usually go as preachers, it's not the primary purpose of God including this in Scripture. There, there are more agendas. I'd mention one more, uh, a not-my-fault agenda. Can't you hear David making excuses? I'm tired. I'm stressed. I'm entitled. Uh, there's a target on my back. I couldn't help it. I needed it. I'm, I'm so much more important than everybody else that my circumstances are different. The rules don't apply to me. And after all, I am the king. Look at any scandal on the news and you're going to see that kind of an attitude. So there, there's something to be learned from each one of those agendas. And perhaps there is value in considering all those things. Let's take the next few moments to consider some primary realities from this tragic narrative. In other words, what would be God's agenda in sharing this with us? Because I want to know. I, I want to know why I have to talk about David and Bathsheba today. Why did God even put that in the Bible? So let me suggest a couple of realities. Here's the first one. Because this story shows us the ugly reality of all sin and temptation. Let me ask you this, and maybe something specific will come to mind. Have you ever done something wrong that got completely out of control and you wonder how it ever went that far and how it ever happened because the cascading events that you did not foresee kept happening? You never meant for it to go down that way. You think David got up that morning and said, you know what, I think I'm gonna ruin my life. I think I'm going to ruin Bathsheba's life. I think I'm going to murder somebody today. I think I'm going to cause problems that my kids and their kids and their kids are going to pay for. I think I'm going to put this massive irrevocable stain on my legacy so that whenever I am talked about in the future, this terrible thing that I did will be remembered. I think today I'm just going to purposely tick God off. You think David decided that day to do that? Uriah dies. David's character's compromised. Bathsheba suffers. The child dies. David's closest aides now know who he really is. He started a generational cycle of sin and violence that was even worse than his own sons. Innocent people, downline suffered, individuals suffered, families suffered, the nation suffered, and God was angry and displeased. I mean, this started a mess. It was a chaotic convergence of compounding crescendo of, con of consequence. You ever, you ever been in that situation or watched it unfold? And in the New Testament, James says, each person is tempted, this is in James 1, when they're dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. And then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. And David found him in a place where he found himself in a place where he never intended to be. And he shows us the ugly reality of sin and temptation. Now we could do some situational spiritual forensics you know, the lead-up dynamics to all of this. He's staying home at a time that kings go off to war. 
He should be at war, but instead he's staying home. He's idle. He's not doing anything. And we know what we hear about idleness from the old saying, right? He has a complete lack of accountability. He's already got a problem with lust and indulgence. He has a sense of entitlement. His ego's getting too big. He's believing his own press reports. He's evidently neglected his interior world, and he doesn't have a problem with the abuse of power. So David has already started down this road. In fact, there's a little clue later for an attitude that already existed, even though it hadn't been said. It's in 2 Samuel 21, 17. It says, then the men of David swore to him saying, you shall not go out again with us to battle so that you do not extinguish the lamp of Israel. David, you are just too important. We're gonna buy some key man insurance on you and we're not gonna send you out to battle anymore because you're so important. And then David goes line dancing. Now, I'm not talking about country line dancing. I mean, he's always just stepping up to the line and seeing how close he could get. And when you play around on that line, eventually you step over the line or you fall over the line. And I just want to say to you right now, and, and to myself, if there's something going on in your life right now where you're just walking on the line and you know there's the possibility that you could step over the line, but you're not going to. And you take a look at David's story because he shows us the ugly reality of sin and temptation. I, I like the old saying about sin. It says sin will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. You know who that's really usually attributed to? a preacher and apologist named Rafi Zacharias who died in disgrace, was an incredible apologist and preacher and he died in scandalous disgrace and I wonder if he knew in his heart, sin will always take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay and cost you more than you want to pay. Wikipedia has a page devoted to inventors who are killed by their own inventions and it's a, and it's a surprisingly long list. You got Thomas uh, Andrews who was the designer of the Titanic, died on the Titanic. More recently, Stockton Rush, who invented the Titan submersible that explored the Titanic, and he died in the, the submersible. You, you got Francis Stanley, who invented the Stanley Steamer, and he died in the Stanley Steamer. You got du Fred Duesenberg, the inventor of the Duesenberg automobile, who died in a crash in a Duesenberg. You've even got an early inventor of a motorized bicycle for GE, and the inventor crashed the prototype and died. And when we allow the imaginations of our heart to go evil, and when we step over that line, and when we walk in sin, we can end up suffering from our own mind inventions. And so the Bible says in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. The problem is we don't want to talk about sin anymore, but the Bible shows us the ugly reality of sin and temptation. But it also shows us something else. It shows us the hidden reality of spiritual forces and warfare. Now, let me ask you to, to uh, imagine for a moment that you are the devil. That's going to be more of a stretch for some of you than others. Let's imagine back in this day of David, you... You're the devil, and you know David was God's chosen. You know he's the king of all God's people. You know somehow he fits into God's plan for the future to, to eternally save the world. You know that God made far-reaching promises to David. You know that God called David a man after his own heart, and you know that David is a priority target. Where would you aim your evil artillery and lay your minefields and concentrate your attacks? On David. So I just want to acknowledge that David had a massive target on his back. That doesn't excuse him, but he had a massive target on his back. The plan of salvation went through him. And as I'll say it again, this is not a reason to excuse him. The Bible says God will not allow you to be tempted above that which you are able, but will with the temptation provide a way of escape. David had a way of escape. He didn't take the way of escape. It's his fault. But let's just admit, he had a big target on his back. David could have turned around and walked down from that rooftop after he saw Bathsheba. David could have gone to war in the first place. And even after his initial sin with Bathsheba, he could have confessed and owned it instead of killing Uriah. But let's not deny there were things going on in much higher places than the bedroom of the palace. 
The Bible says in Ephesians 6, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the authorities, the powers, the dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. We are talking about unseen spiritual forces that want us to fail. They're real. But the difference between David and us is we have the advantage of knowing some of you have been around for a little while. If you followed professional tennis, remember the names Andre Agassi and Boris Becker, champion tennis players, and Becker always won. And Agassi could not beat Boris Becker. After losing to Becker in their first three matches, Agassi then won eight straight matches over Becker, including some high-profile wins like the U.S. Open and the French Open. And he finished his career 10-4 and four all-time against Becker. You know how he did it? He studied the lead up to, to Becker's famously powerful serve and he noticed that every time right before Becker served the ball, he would stick his tongue out. And whichever direction Becker's tongue was pointing, that's where the serve went. And so for the rest of their career, he didn't tell anybody. And he watched Boris Becker's tongue and he had to make sure it wasn't obvious that that's what he's watching and save it for the right point in the match. And so he won almost every time because he learned his opponent and he beat him consistently. And he never revealed that secret until his retirement. And he said in an interview, uh, after we both retired, we went out and had a pint together and I couldn't help but say this to him. By the way, did you know you used to do this and give away the direction of your serve? And he said, Boris Becker almost fell out of his chair. And Boris Becker said, I used to go home all the time after we played and tell my wife, it's like he reads my mind. <laughs> and Becker said, little did I know you were just reading my tongue. I want to go back and watch all the video of Michael, Jackson, uh, my, Michael Jordan sticking his tongue out before the slam dunk to see if there was any indication that defenders could have gotten from watching. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 2.11, that Satan might not outwit us for we're not unaware of his schemes. Hey, there's something more going on in your life than what's just going on here. There are spiritual forces in high places that want us to fail, but we're not going to be ignorant of those schemes. And so when we look at the reality of David's life, we have to point that out. And then of course, there is the beautiful reality of repentance and redemption. You might remember how it happened. David thought he got away with it. And then he got a visit from the preacher. Well, the prophet, Nathan. And this preacher had guts. I mean, guts. And he begins by capturing David's mind and emotions with a seemingly innocuous story. He said, there was this rich guy. He had a bunch of livestock. He had all kinds of cows and, and sheep. And he had a neighbor. And his neighbor was a poor man. And, and the poor man had one little lamb, but it was like a family pet. In fact, this little lamb would drink out of his cup and they would cradle the lamb with his children in, their, in his arms like uh, someone would cradle a daughter. It was his only lamb. And a visitor came, a guest came to the rich man's house and the rich man thought, I don't want to kill any of my livestock. I'm going to take that guy's one little lamb and I'm going to slaughter it and I'm going to use it for dinner. And that's what he did. So the preacher, Nathan, tells this innocuous story to David. And when David heard the story, he's rightfully furious. He said, the man who did this deserves to die and his estate should pay back fourfold. We're talking punitive damages. And the preacher looked the king, David, in the eye. And he said, you are that man. And then the prophet said, this is what the Lord God of Israel says. I, I anointed you king over Israel. I rescued you from Saul. I gave you your master Saul's house and his wives. I, I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. If that weren't enough, I would have given you more. Why did you despise my word by doing what I considered evil? You had Uriah the Hittite killed in battle. You took his wife as your wife. You used the Ammonites to kill him. And I'm telling you that violence will never leave your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. And by the way, your child's gonna die. Your women are gonna be assaulted by those closest to you. And what you did in secret will happen openly to you and your family. The preacher said all that to David. And David said, I have sinned, you think? But those three words, I have sinned, began the process of repentance and forgiveness and redemption. You can read David's prayer 
at this very moment in his life in Psalm 51, be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgression, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin. I know my transgressions. My, my sin is always before me and against you and you only I have sinned and done what's evil in your sight so that you are justified when you speak and you are blameless when you judge. Behold, I, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me and behold, you desire truth in the innermost being and in the hidden part you'll make me know wisdom. Purify me with hyssop and, and I'll be clean. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the, let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Don't cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of my salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. And on his prayer goes, I agree with uh, Paul Carter who said David's story is the ugliest and most beautiful story in the Bible. It's a story of an ugly sin and a beautiful savior. And once again, what this story does is it leaves me with questions, more questions. And I don't know the answer to all the questions that arise here. I, I only know that the journey back begins with repentance. God, I am sorry. I was wrong. Please forgive me and please lead me. And David writes in Psalm 32, blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord doesn't count against him and whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent about my sin, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me and my strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. But then I acknowledged my sin to you and didn't cover up my iniquity and I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you, God, forgave the guilt of my sin. Let me just ask you this. Do you need to do that? It's not just about getting dunked in water. It's not just about Repeating some words. It says, repent and be baptized and wash away your sins. Acts 3 verse 19 says, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out and that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. There is this beautiful reality of repentance and redemption in David's story. And there's one more thing. We're out of time, so I'll say it quickly. But this may be the most important thing of all. There is the unstoppable reality of God's purpose and his promise. Because once again, in every story in David's life teaches us this. God's purpose will prevail. God always keeps his promises. God's character stays perfect. And God uses the mess to accomplish his will. You know what it says about David in the New Testament? And by the way, people who are saved in the Old Testament, when it gets to the New Testament, their faults are never mentioned again. You know what it says about David in the New Testament in Acts 13? It says, when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep and he was buried with his ancestors and his body decayed. I sometimes look at David's life. Why did God let him get away? Oh, David did worse things than what Saul did. But it's because God had made a promise to David and God's purpose ran through David. And I think this might be one of the biggest clues to all the questions this leaves us with. In addition to the fact that we know God's character and he's a God of mercy and grace, we know God has a purpose. And so I want to invite you to do two things in response it's what I want to do today. I want to throw myself on his mercy. Because when I, when I think back on life and I see scenes, I'm like, I can't believe that I did that. I can't believe that was me. And, and there's what's true about a person and then there's the truth about a person, right? So there's the truth about me, but there, there are also some things that they're just true. They happened. I want to throw myself on his mercy. 
and I want to align myself with his purpose. It's not enough to just say, I'm gonna throw myself on his mercy. I throw myself on his mercy, but then I say, repentance says, I wanna get in line with you. I wanna align myself with your purpose because if you are on board with the purposes of God, you can't fail. If you don't get on board, you get left behind. And if you get in the way of the purposes of God, you'll just get run over. Throw yourself at his mercy. Align yourself with his purpose. That's what I want us to do as a church. Throw ourselves and all our imperfections on his mercy and align ourselves with his will and his purpose. If you are ready to do that today, to repent of your sins, to put your faith in Jesus and align yourself with him, we invite you to do it. There's a door right there. The letter F is over the door. There will be somebody there waiting to help you. And this could be the day, the continental divide in your life, not for the bad, but for the good from now on, aligned with God and his mercy. Don't leave today without doing that. Father God, thank you for the story of David. We're appalled. We, we see the evil that David did and it defies iman- imagination to see that he's the same guy that wrote some of the Psalms. But we're appalled not just by David's sin, we're appalled by our own. We see our own capacity for depravity. We know our own history. We think of the alarm bells we've ignored. And we think of the situations that have gotten out of control that we never intended to happen. And the mess we've made, the crescendo of consequence. And we throw ourselves on your mercy and we want to align ourselves with your will from now on. Help us do it in Jesus' name, amen. I promise the worst of the stories are over in David. We're gonna move to some good things in the next few uh, weeks. God bless you, have a great week.